This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. A little while ago, I was at South by Southwest to facilitate a discussion on neurodiversity hiring. Now, you've heard me talk about this before. This is hiring people who think differently from us neurotypicals. And in my case, it's the work we do with a nonprofit that I'm involved in called HackingAutism.org. Now, this show is not about the neurodiversity hiring, and it's not about hacking autism. It's really about kind of an eye-opening situation that occurred to me at South by Southwest this year. Now, if you've never been to South by Southwest, you should go at least once. It's held in Austin, Texas. It's a multi-week event. Now, it's part music festival, part innovation reveal. Now, some big innovations have been launched at South by Southwest, including Twitter. Twitter actually launched the application for the first time at South by Southwest, and people at South by Southwest were using it to communicate with each other, coordinate attending the night parties, all kinds of uh, activities going on, and that's where Twitter got its original foothold. So if you haven't been to South by Southwest, you probably just need to go there. Now, for me, it has been, it was a little bit of an eye-opener, because while I was walking around, they have events and talks and uh, big main stage activities, those kinds of things. And you're looking at all the technologies, and they've got what I would call is kind of a show floor area. But I noticed something very similar to what I saw at CES this year back in January, is that everyone is copying everyone else. Hear this out. The number of copycat innovations was mind-boggling. Now, don't get me wrong here. You know, it's my, it's my opinion that all ideas are built on the innovations that came f for us. But it was shocking at South by Southwest and at CES this year about the lack of originality. But this lack of originality gets tied to, you know, the look is the same, the feel is the same, the function, all being identical. How many different artificial reality VR goggles do we need that look almost identical to each other? Everything doesn't need to have artificial intelligence in it. Not, you know, not to mention the marketing team just slapping AI on anything they're trying to sell. And I'll tell you right now, wireless is not the magic solution that will solve all of our ills by itself. Now, some of this is hype, right? You can't knock the sales and marketing teams from, you know, trying to use whatever the latest buzzword is to sell something. But when you walk on a show floor and you see tens, or in some cases like CES, hundreds of nearly identical products. Now, in the past, we would attribute that to certain regions of the world. You know, they would go someplace, buy a product, take it back to their home country, duplicate it, produce millions of them, flood the market. Now, I'm not saying that still does occur. Don't get me wrong, it does. But even amongst the innovators, we are seeing more and more of these, what I would call some fresh ideas, but immediately you see tens, if not hundreds of people doing the exact same thing. And this is, becomes really, I think, a challenge. I think a challenge for me personally, because when I look at it, I'm saying we c couldn't do anything better. We wasted an innovation effort simply by copying. Now, the real issue here is, is you know, what's really bothering me is that these copycat innovations then are trying to claim that they were the originator or the first in this category, even when it's clear that the original innovator brought something significant to the market. 
this dearth of acknowledgement, of recognizing that we innovate on top of others for those that came before, and we should be giving them the credit. What was the inspiration for these innovations? Right Now, if it's a true copycat where you're just literally throwing it into the product version of a Xerox machine and producing you know, uh, an exact duplicate of something that somebody else did, that, I think, is just flat out wrong. What I'm talking about is, is if you got inspired, you looked at something, somebody came out with something new, but you're going to build something and you're going to improve on it, that's great. But where's the acknowledgement? We tend not to want to really give credit where credit is due for these innovations. And look, it's ha been happening you know, for, for decades, hundreds of years, thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. When someone does come up with something new and it's really a great option, everybody hops onto the bandwagon, right? Whether it's the, the invention of the plow, the invention of uh, uh, the automobile, the invention of you know, the, the steam engine. Soon as one person cracks the code and gets that first thing up and running, then the market gets flooded with tens if not hundreds of thousands of, of copycats. Now, you would probably say back there and you're going, okay, yeah, but hold on here, Phil. Isn't that what patent law is there to protect? Yes and no. Yes, from the standpoint of legal protection, such that if you are the true originator of an idea, then you should get credit. And if people are truly copying from you, you should be you know, fairly rewarded for being the one that did it first because doing it first is incredibly hard. Getting it right, right out of the gate, that is incredibly hard. Secondarily, though, in some cases, the patents aren't going to be enough because, look, it is not as hard as most people think to design around patents. If somebody has patented something and you want to build something similar, could you design it in such a way as not to violate their patent? There are entire companies, entire law firms, entire organizations that get funded to design around patents so that they don't have to acknowledge who the original uh, inventor was in a new category, in a new, uh, in a new offering. And I know that's probably pretty frustrating for those of you you know, particularly if you're a lone inventor, you're on your own, you're trying to create something and you're trying to create a market, you're trying to create a life, this is what you want to do, you want to be that inventor, but you are, you know, stuck with the whole issue of you don't get the proper acknowledgement and you don't get uh, the ability to collect any form of compensation for being the originator of a given idea. So... Uh, yes, patents will try to protect it in some cases from a legal perspective, but I'm not talking about just like the near-term stuff either. People out there claiming that they're the first ones to do certain things when in reality we all know who came before us. But gosh forbid if a company or an innovator were to give credit or acknowledgement to the inspirations that came before before. And that's what I'm talking about here today. What what if you sit back and thought about not just being an innovator, but being an ethical innovator, what does that mean? An innovator for me is somebody that can just invent. Now, not all things that could be invented should be invented. I'll repeat that. There are some things that could be invented that maybe should not be invented. At the same time, if you're an ethical innovator, what role do you play in providing the acknowledgement and credit to those that inspired you, that inspired the work that you're doing, inspired the product and services that you're doing? I am a big believer that you've got to just have take off the rose-colored glasses and really look at what was that thing or those group of things or individuals or people that came before us 
that put they caused you to put the right combination together to come up with an innovation that was just absolutely mind blowing. Now, look, I don't have all the answers. What I'm going to do for the rest of this show is I'm just sharing with you my thoughts around this, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this whole concept of ethical innovation and copycat innovations. So drop me a note. We've got uh, the rest of the show. We're going to be talking about this. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your contributions, and what your own experiences have been in, one, you getting the acknowledgement for credit, or two, you acknowledging others for the inspirations they were. So stay right there. We've got a great show. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this quick break. Welcome back to Innovations. We're talking today about copycat innovation, but also kind of weaving into it to talk about what does it mean to be an ethical innovator. Now, are all copycat innovations bad? No. Let me be clear there. I'm not saying that all copycat innovations are bad. There's actually a clear opportunity, clear opportunity to take someone's ideas as inspiration and improve upon it. Now, an ethical innovator You need to give proper credit and acknowledgement to the source of your inspirations. What is disappointing is that most innovators do not do that. Don't give the credit. They maybe apply some incremental twist and bring an innovation to market and then focus on telling the story that puts themselves in the position of being the innovator. You know, being the third or fourth entrant into a new area does not qualify a company to claim they have the innovator for a given space. At the same time, there's a strategy that says being first in is not always a good thing. Let the first entrants enter a new segment, spend all their monies educating the market on the need and the solution, and then the follow-on entrants then come in and clean up. This is a well-proven model that has worked. Example, Apple did not invent the smartphone. There were actually multiple generations of smartphones before them. They waited. They waited till they got the timing right. Oracle did not invent the SQL database. Google did not invent search. Microsoft did not invent the PC operating system. In fact, Apple did not invent touch interfaces or even the pinch motion on touch screens. Ford did not invent the automobile. Tesla did not invent the electric car. Right? They took their inspirations for those that came before. Now, what these companies did do is they did improve on the idea, and they used timing to their advantage. Now, what I wish was is that these companies would acknowledge their inspirations. Give credit to the innovators that came before. Now, this may sound counter because you've heard me on this show talk many times about do not worry about the credit. And when I say that, I'm talking to the innovator who's actually doing the invention, right? You know, it's just not becoming for an innovator to spend all their time trying to thump their own chests or claim things, right? You need to get your head and your your whole mind comfortable with the fact that you may invent something and never get acknowledgement for it. What I'm talking to are the innovators that use those innovations as inspirations. Just as you would like to get acknowledged for your role in creating or inventing something, Acknowledging the innovators that inspired you is what we all should be doing. Especially if we want to claim a mantle of being an ethical innovator. Now, when I say that I wish that all these companies, whether it be Apple, Oracle, Google, Microsoft, whoever, would acknowledge their inspiration. Now, I can hear the lawyers out there just absolutely gnashing their teeth pounding the table and screaming, no, you can't do that, don't say that. Because if they did do that, the lawyers would be concerned that they would get sued. 
If you acknowledge that you were inspired by something invented by somebody else, then do you get sued for copyright infringement? Do you get sued by for patent violations? That may, you might need to pay royalties. Okay, but if in fact they were inspired, then shouldn't they acknowledge it? What's the right thing to do? To date, the best source for acknowledgement in today's world seems to be Wikipedia. Given the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pages, millions of pages in Wikipedia, you can do a pretty good job of trying to figure out, based on a certain innovation, what came before it. And in some cases, pages are created to actually focus on just giving acknowledgement, recognizing an inspiration for an innovation uh, that came before. Now, what's really interesting is, is that you know, this is where the battle for credit is waged. It's that nonstop edits and re-edits occurring in Wikipedia. It's where everybody fights out who did what first. Take podcasting as an example. There, you know, I don't know, it's probably got to be 10 years ago. There was a big Wikipedia battle going on because of uh, multiple people claiming to have invented podcasting. And the page on the on podcasting in Wikipedia was literally being edited tens if not hundreds of times a day, adding people's names in. Somebody else would edit, take that name out, put their own name in. The next, you know, an hour later, someone would take the name out and put the other name in. You know, that is, well, one, it was humorous at the time, but that's, not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about not, you know, me logging in and taking credit for something and putting my own name in it. It's about the acknowledgement from other innovators that, yes, the work you did was great, it was significant, and we need to grant you credit for that. We need to give you credit. Not you take credit, but with that we give you credit. And the, you know, so, the, you know, so my frustration is, is that I can look back across a number of technologies, the fields I've been in, and you can see the inspirations, but nobody has actually given credit. And that is one of my frustrations of, of where did we get off the rails on this? Why, why do we not acknowledge the people that came before us? Nearly everything ever invented was inspired by something or someone. Now, some of it's insignificant. I get that. But some of it was significant. But sometimes we just don't take the time. And that could be inspiration from even a coach or a mentor. Somebody that early in your career really made a significant impact or some inspiration that really helped you to go down a path. And I guess this is important to me because I'm getting at that stage in my life where I've got more years behind me than I have years in front of me. And at this stage, I am looking back and I can see all of the things that had an influence that ultimately got me to where I am today and the phenomenal career I had to get where I am at today. And I guess I want to take this time and I do want to acknowledge and I am reaching out to people that have acknowledged, that have inspired me and just to say thank you and to give them the credit where the credit is due. And I would encourage all of you to stay, take a few moments and do the same. And I'll be right back because i got more to talk about this. You're listening to Killer Innovations. Welcome back to Killer Innovations. We're talking about copycat innovations. And one of the questions that I know is probably rattling around your head is, what are some examples of good copycat innovations? Now, there's a part of the innovation industry that look at innovations from completely uh, different industries that can be copied. So in some cases, uh, in, in the killer question card deck, it'll show up as, are there analogous industries that have a similar structure, et cetera, that you could look at that can be an inspiration or can give you ideas. So yes, 
there are copycat innovations that are actually good, looking across to other industries, looking at analogous companies and, and looking to how you apply or copy what they're doing, but twisting it so it fits into your industry. And there's another one called, you know, one that in nature. Now, I did a, a, a podcast, it's got to be over 10 years ago, on uh, biomimicry. So biomimicry is the act of looking at nature and copying what nature is doing and applying it to your product or service, et cetera. So some examples would be the invention of Velcro. So Velcro was invented uh, when someone went walking in uh, through uh, tall grass and it had burrs and the burrs hooked on and, and clung to the socks and to the pants. Um, when the person went back home and they tried to peel them off, that the inspiration was the hooks and the uh, loops uh, on Velcro. And ultimately, then nature inspired the invention of, uh, of Velcro. You know, another example is looking at geckos and how geckos clean the glass and clean, clean the walls. Came up with the concepts of how do you, uh, you know, that, that clinginess, that contact surface, the way. Uh, the geckos operated been used in a large number of products. So biomimicry is copycat innovations based on nature. So that's another example of a good copycat innovation. Now, in the case of both Velcro and some of the other ones, those innovators fully acknowledge their inspirations. Yeah, I was inspired by those burrs going into my socks, or I looked at the gecko and figured out how they... Uh, contacted with glass, and so therefore I could develop, design, you know, new kinds of suction cups, etc., that worked better. That's an example of giving credit where credit is due. Now, great innovators, innovators that are you know out there creating just phenomenal new breakthrough kinds of products and services, um, recognize that what they really are doing is they're making a unique set of connections. Innovation, as we've said, is always, there's always some form of an inspiration. It's extremely, extremely rare that something is invented that is tr truly, totally has no previous inspiration. I would probably say it's never happened. But let's put it this way I've never heard of one. There probably, there may be one out there. I've just never heard of one that where an innovation truly came out of where there was zero, no previous inspiration. Great innovators are the ones who put together the connections from a wide range of sources and inspirations, but it's that combination in a unique way that creates that new innovation. That's still innovation. The innovator created something that didn't exist before by combining something that others had created. But my challenge still exists. If you do a copycat innovation across industries, across technologies, across nature, then shouldn't you still acknowledge the inspiration? I would say yes. Now, why am I pounding on this so hard? Why am I dedicating a whole show to this? Is because it's amazing when I go out and I, I teach or I teach a book uh, boot camp or I'm giving a lecture or I'm running a one-day workshop about how many people have this false impression that to be an innovator, you have to come. It has to be something original that you come up with yourself, versus acknowledging the inspiration. So I think if all of us as innovators would acknowledge what has inspired us to come up or that develop this particular solution, it actually would break the veil and, and to to the people who are looking to try to come up with innovations. That hey, you don't have to come up with that truly. 100% novel. If, you, if it's inspired by something, it doesn't mean that it's automatically not an innovation. It is still an innovation. We just need to acknowledge the inspiration. Now, I also have a little bit of a selfish reason why I, I'm big on acknowledgement and I'm big on looking at what the inspiration was for different ideas. Because I think by looking at those inspirations, and you'll find that there's a certain pattern to those inspirations, ones that trigger lots of really interesting connections and interesting ideas. So I spend a fair amount of time looking at innovations today and looking at what their original inspirations were to look for those patterns so that I can see 
potentially see those patterns again somewhere else that may lead me to a path to a totally uh, new innovation. Now, don't take this all wrong, right? I'm not just challenging you. I'm challenging myself. Now, have I been perfect in this regard of giving credit for inspiration over my 35-year career in innovation? No. There were probably lots of innovations that were inspired by others that I didn't give proper credit to. So as an ethical innovator, what are we to do? I don't have all the answers, but it's something we should think about and talk about. And in fact, um, I'll, I'm going to initiate uh, a channel or at least uh, maybe a conversation in the general channel over in the innovators.community. So the innovators.community is a private Slack area where conversations and topics like what appears on the show or from any of the innovators that are part of that community uh, where we can hop on and continue the conversation. So I'm going to continue thinking about this. I want to continue to share and and uh, get some uh, more thoughts and some more feedback from others um, over in the community. If you're not part of the Innovators community, you should be. Um, you can hop over to the innovators.community. So spell it all out. You know, so it's the innovators.community. And that put, I'll take you to a landing page. I'll tell you all about it. It is a private community. Um, it is of vetted innovators, so people who either have an innovation role or inventors or uh, innovator leaders within organizations. Um, and it is a subscription. So it, it, there is a subscription uh, fee in order to be part of the community. Um, that helps fund the community and keeps it up. But it's private, so therefore we can we control it. It's only for vetted um, innovators. So if you want to check it out, go over to the innovators.community. And I want to continue the conversation on this thing, this concept of copycat innovations and the role of the ethical innovator. Now, one thought that I'm going to toss out here, we'll continue the conversation over in the community, is just as academics provide detailed footnotes in their papers where they acknowledge everything that's in the paper, should we do something similar when we launch an innovation? Should we give the should we give credit to the inspiration that led to the innovation that we came up with? And I'm going to play around with this, and I'm going to start doing this today. I'm also, as I said in the last segment, I'm at the stage in my life where I've got, you know, I've got more years behind me than I have in front of me. So I'm kind of at that stage where I'm looking back and and acknowledging, recognizing. The peoples, the ideas, the innovations, the technologies that inspired me to create the innovations that I did create. And going back and finding those original innovators and giving them the acknowledgement, giving you the credit. And I can tell you I've done that a few times now here recently, which is what's inspired this show. And the response was unbelievable. The look on their face just to get that acknowledgement was life-changing for some of those people who are also you know, at that stage in the life when they're looking back on their career and trying to say, did I have an impact? Did I do it? Did I, am I leaving a legacy? Did, did I inspire somebody to go do something? So I'm going to start today and I'm going to do that for this show. This podcast was inspired by an audio series I subscribed to in the early 80s called Insight, put out by Nightingale Conant starring Earl Nightingale. You've heard me before talk about Earl Nightingale. I've never met him. I have had conversations with his widow um, recently. Um, but uh, this podcast is modeled off of that. And Earl and the team at Nightingale Conant should get acknowledgement for that, for the inspiration they gave me, which led, which led to now the 14th season of Killer Innovations. And with that, we're going to check out. Stay tuned. Five minutes to new ideas. We'll be following up in the next segment. You don't want to miss it. So stay right there. We'll be right back after this quick break. Back in the early days of this show, I would share what I called a killer question in each episode. These questions were designed to be used in your personal team or organization's innovation efforts. Now, based on feedback from listeners just like you, 
we've decided to bring it back with some improvements. Each episode of the Kill Innovations has a segment that I'm now calling Five Minutes to New Ideas. It's designed for the creative mind looking for that next great idea. Each episode will challenge you to think differently about yourself, your business, and your products and services by asking unique, funny, and sometimes crazy questions. These questions are designed to force you to look beyond the obvious and to uncover ideas and opportunities you never before considered. So, get out your notebook and be ready to uncover that game-changing idea. Here is 5 Minutes to New Ideas. A big part of any business is being aware of and responding to the life cycles of the industry and its customers. Some of these are easy to see. You only need a cursory understanding of the effects of OPEC on gas prices in the early 70s to understand why cars became more fuel efficient in that decade. Other reasons are hard to see. Some criteria can be faddish based on things such as color or brand. Others are based on external influences. For years, the cell phone industry fought to offer the smallest, thinnest possible phone. That's what customers wanted. Now those same customers are prioritizing access to the web over the size of the phone. This has reversed what was seen as a key and unshakable evolution trend towards smaller phones. Now customers want larger phones with bigger screens. Sometimes trends can be reversed by something completely outside your control something that changes the buying decision. What will these same consumers want as they get older? Will full web access and streaming music and video be a priority? Or will their need change as their eyesight and hearings fade? Remember the cycle part of life cycle. You may lose the connection with your customers at certain stages of their lives, but regain it again later. It's like the young man who buys a sports car when he gets out of college, trades it in for a minivan when he marries and has kids, and finally reverts back to the sports car as an empty nester. Don't assume that a customer's lost forever just because they've shifted their allegiances for the time being. If you can maintain some kind of link during the years they are not using your product, you still have a good shot at winning them back again when their needs and your services match up better. We are rarely fortunate enough to know exactly how our customers' needs will change. We simply know that they will. The simplest way to anticipate how radically your customers' needs and wants may evolve is to look at the past. Think about how our expectations of personal transportation have evolved. When my great-grandfather needed transportation, he looked for a sturdy horse and a well-made saddle. My father wanted a car. One of my first vehicles was a motorcycle, as it was all I could afford at the time. Simply understanding what products fell in and out of use isn't enough. You need to consider the entwined relationship between people and the products that allow their lives to evolve. The more our grandparents and our parents came to rely on going wherever they wanted, the more their lives were built around that very premise. My great-grandfather needed to live near where he worked. He couldn't have had a 50-mile commute to work. Yet now we assume that this is normal. Understanding this constant back and forth between the products we use and how they affect our lives can help you predict how this relationship will evolve in the future. What will personal transportation look like 10 years in the future? Will new traffic flow and work scheduling solutions allow greater mobility and the continuation on suburban lifestyle? Or will people become so frustrated with ever worsening commutes that they return to dense urban areas or flee to the rural ones? Could these changes affect your customers' buying decisions? And if so, what are you going to do about it? What other cycles like this can you start to anticipate now? Stay close to your existing customers and talk to them. Realize that they might not understand their own needs. It's up to you to ask the right question that will get you a more nuanced perspective on what is driving them and their lives. Their buying decisions are not going to be the same three or even four years from now. So never stop asking, what will my future customers' buying criteria be? To get to what is driving the real change, you need to ask, what are the ways your future customers' lives are changing? How will that influence what they buy? 
And what will they abandon and no longer purchase as their lives change? By challenging yourself and your team to think about your customer's future, you stand a great chance of staying ahead of those inevitable changes. I'm Phil McKinney, and thanks for listening. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join in. If you have any comments or suggestions, drop me a note at phil at killerinnovations.com. Beyond this show, I write about my personal experiences of being in the innovation game for the last two decades. Topics include innovation, creativity, culture, team building, metrics, frustrations, leadership, and how to win. You can find that content over at philmckinney.com. You can also find out information about my book, Beyond the Obvious, including extensive excerpts over at beyondtheobvious.com. You can find hardcover, digital, and audio versions of my book on Amazon or wherever you get your books from. Now, the reason I started this show back in 2005 was to pay back my early mentor. My first mentor, Bob Davis, invested an immense amount of time in training and coaching me, which had a major impact on my career. When I went back and asked him how I could pay him back, he laughed and said I couldn't. I had to pay it forward. If I could ask for a favor, could you help me pay it forward? How? One, by giving us a rating wherever you get your podcast, as that helps spread the word. And two, by telling others about the show. If you want to be part of the conversation between the shows, I hang out in the Innovators community on Slack. The Innovators community is a private community of vetted innovators who help each other succeed. Check it out at theinnovators.community. This episode of Kill Innovations was produced by the Innovators Network. You can find the show notes and the entire show catalog going back to 2005 at killerinnovations.com. I'll talk to you next week, and in the meantime, go out and change the world with your killer innovation. Bye-bye.